so it's 1130. I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I wanted to say thank you for joining us today. My name is Sydney or Sid Pickern and I'm a staff attorney here at DREDF. And we are back at it in, in the training. We've put together what we hope is a helpful presentation on reasonable accommodations in California housing and COVID-19. And before we begin, I have just a couple housekeeping notes. Um, Real-time captioning is available if you go ahead and click the captioning uh, button at the bottom of the training. We are asking you to please put your questions in the chat or send them directly to me. Uh, my contact information will be listed at the end of the training and uh, we, will get, we will follow up with folks individually. And of course, we will also post the training on our housing policy page at dreadf.org and we will send around the PowerPoint um, uh, after the training to folks that have registered. Very briefly, as many of you know, DREDF is a national law and policy center by and for people with disabilities. And we work on a wide range of disability rights issues, including access to housing, healthcare, and education. We are also a support center for frontline legal service providers across the state, which means that we are here to provide technical assistance on disability rights, including disability rights and housing. We know that the housing situation in California is dire and that the homelessness numbers are truly unacceptable. And we continue to work every day to advance housing equity for the disability community with the lens of both historical disability and racial segregation. I also wanted to let folks know that we will be having a number of trainings in the new year including a training on encampments and vehicle camping, which we hope uh, you will be able to join us for. And we will also be ramping up our advocacy in the Project Home Key program to help ensure that people with disabilities utilizing hotels and motels are also having equal access to those programs. And again, I wanna thank you for joining us today and with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Linda Kilb, to start us off. Thank you, Sydney, and thanks to everyone who has joined us today. We're always delighted to be in contact, however remotely. Uh, as Sydney mentioned, we are a part of the formal legal services system in California. So in addition to providing our expertise, we also um, rely on the trends and issues that colleagues across the state share with us. So we are going to launch into that partnership right now. Um, this slide just sort of gives a little blueprint of what we're gonna cover today, including definitions of disability under federal and California law, issues related to people with disabilities who are at high risk for outcomes, serious outcomes from COVID infection, analysis relevant to people associated with those with disabilities, regardless of whether they themselves have disabilities, and reasonable accommodation analysis, including direct threat and some tenant protections at the end. So we'll go to the next slide. So this slide is a very, very brief summary of the civil rights definition of disability under federal law. And just to note, disability is a term of art throughout many uh, federal and state canons. So you just wanna make sure as you're analyzing something that you're using the statutory definition that's most relevant to your goals. Uh, on the federal side, we have what's called the three-prong definition. And the first prong is that you need an actual impairment, which is a physical or mental impairment, including medical disabilities, that substantially limits one or more major life activities. So that's the first way that you can qualify for coverage. The second way is that you can have a record of an impairment the type of impairment that's identified in the first prong. Uh, 
And this notably can be either a correct record or an erroneous record. So if there's a diagnosis um, that someone is looking at, regardless of whether that is a correct diagnosis or not, and that's the basis for adverse treatment, that would be a second prong disability. Similarly, anyone who's had a, an actual disability, but it's receded, something perhaps like cancer or other medical conditions could qualify under this second prong. The third prong is what's called the regarded as prong. And in this analysis, we don't focus on the person with the impairment. We focus on how that person is being viewed by others, including entities, um, certainly housing providers um, can come into that group. There's an extraordinarily nuanced history of this definition. It stretches all the way back into the 1970s. Um, it, it's a type of thing where we're more than happy to provide technical assistance as you're trying to identify the correct legal analysis for your particular clients. Um, but I'm not gonna go into great detail beyond that. Um, I will flag just a couple other things. One is that you analyze the significant or substantial limitation as to the disability without any ameliorative or mitigating measures. So this includes, it can include hearing aids, it can include medical drugs um, like insulin. So basically what you're trying to do is identify without that mitigating measure, would the impairment meet the definition? And if it does meet the definition without the mitigating measure, it doesn't actually matter for purposes of that threshold, whether um, it would not be limiting enough if the mitigating measure is included in the analysis. The other thing I'll flag that's particularly relevant to us here today is that the Fair Housing Amendments Act which was the 1988 edition of disability to the Federal Fair Housing Act, has a slightly different history. Uh, the technical term of art in that statute is the word handicap, even though that's not disfavored by, uh, that's not favored by the disability community at this point. Um, the rationale for the different tracks is that the Fair Housing Act definition has always been extremely expansive in contrast to definition analysis under other federal laws. So um, the theory was if it's not broke, don't fix it. And therefore the Fair Housing Act definition has just had a steady expansive interpretation rather than the waxing and waning interpretation attendant to other laws. With that, we'll turn to California law. So here in California, we have the federal protections as a floor of protection. So if you can meet the federal definition, you absolutely will meet the California definition, both by incorporation and in all likelihood by um, independent analysis under our, our California standards. So in the California canon, the definition of disability is contained in the Fair Employment and Housing Act, is very broad and independent. And that actually has been a hard fought fight um, through many of the, the courts in the states, but there's now very clear confirmation that California law will remain in its own form, regardless of whether any of the federal laws get changed or eliminated. Uh, one of the key differences, and again, this is um, moving very quickly here, but just to flag the most important difference under California law is that the impairment does not have to substantially limit activities. It can limit activities. So it's eliminating that modifier meaning that there may be instances where something is a California disability, even if it's not a federal disability. So we'll move on here. So in terms of the categories, the California law is structured a little bit differently. It has independent subsections for physical disability, mental disability, medical condition. It also includes provisions that specify that if you require special education under the state special education laws or the federal education laws, that 
automatically qualifies you as having a state disability. Again, we get the record or history of disability regardless of whether the record is in fact accurate. And we have the regarded or treated as prong and the, the analysis and the concept remains the same. Sometimes the statutory term of art is treated as instead of regarded or perceived. So you may see a constellation of those concepts in this prong of analyzing whether in this case, the housing provider is viewing the person as having a disability, whether they have a disability or not. A couple other things in California um, under this regarded or treated prong, um, if the condition is correctly perceived, in other words, the housing provider or the entity um, correctly understands that there is an impairment, but it's not yet impairing or disabling, that can actually constitute a method of coverage under the state law. So we'll move on here. So I didn't, we, Sydney and I actually developed these lists together and we didn't, um, we decided it would perhaps be most accessible if we think about disabilities in chunks of relationships to each other. This is not necessarily binding in terms of the legal analysis, but um, you know, it's helpful sometimes to just ask yourself, what is the manner of the disability or the impairment? So here are some examples. It can be a disability that affects multiple body systems. Um, it can be a chronic or an acute health condition. And some examples are on the screen. They include most organ impairments and other types of medical impairments. Certainly cognitive disabilities are covered and these include things like autism, dementia, Down syndrome. It can also be a cognitive disability resulting from some type of injury or uh, disabling acute condition. So something like traumatic brain injury or a stroke might potentially lead to cognitive disability. There are certainly also mental health disabilities, and these are um, some of the, the well-known ones, including bipolar disorder, clinical depression, post-traumatic stress. Um, there can also be a range of other emotional impairments that may qualify as disabilities if you can go through the analysis of the degree of their limitation. Again, analyzing that without regard to drugs or any ameliorative uh, interventions or devices. Certainly musculoskeletal skeletal and mobility disabilities are, are clearly covered. This includes uh, any type of muscular skeletal issue that would require the use of durable medical equipment like a walker or a wheelchair, but certainly you can qualify regardless of whether you use mobility devices. Um, we can include here people missing limbs, partial or complete amputations, regardless of cause. And there's some other disabilities such as cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis and muscular dystrophy that may have mobility or muscular skeletal impacts. We certainly also have sensory disabilities. These are impairments of vision or impairments of hearing that can also come into play. So we're gonna move to our next slide. So the prior slide really was focused on conditions that have routinely existed and have a long track record of analysis. Here, we're gonna get into the cutting edge landscape um, that we're all facing. And that is this issue of how disabilities, pre-existing disabilities, disabilities that predate the pandemic interrelate with the issues that the pandemic is raising. So one of the things that we certainly hear um, often is that the Center for Disease Control is identifying specific conditions that create high risk for serious outcomes. And these are the things you would expect, respiratory disabilities, immunocompromised disabilities, um, all the things that may put you at more risk if you do contract COVID of having a very bad outcome from that. Virtually all disabilities under California housing, housing law, I'm sorry, excuse me, virtually all of the conditions that the CDC identifies are disabilities under California housing law. Of course, the new twist is whether there's a new implication, a new limitation 
by dint of the fact that you're experiencing that disability during the pandemic. And here's where we start taking these confluences or intersectionality into the substantive analysis. So certainly COVID vulnerable tenants may be protected in two very distinct ways. First of all, they're entitled to non-discrimination. There can't be a landlord um, identifying a specific tenant and saying, I don't want you in my housing because you're at risk of COVID and that scares me. That would be sort of a, a very distinct disability non-discrimination violation. There's also the potential for some reasonable accommodation entitlements that would not at all have been relevant before the pandemic. Um, things like inability to go into common areas anymore, inability to have in-person communications. So we're gonna get a little more into that as we proceed to the next section. Um, but this is just the very, very tip of the iceberg that you know is gonna be unfolding beneath us for a number of years. So case law developments are gonna be extremely likely. There is going to be appellate law made on this. And with that, I will uh, turn to the next slide um, and just flag a couple things that are risks for COVID, but are not necessarily disability civil rights analysis factors. So pregnancy, which by itself is a risk factor, is not a disability under the term of art of the California housing law. Age certainly plays in um, and age can create um, more likelihood of disabilities, but age itself is not a disability, even though it may certainly be a risk factor or is a risk factor for COVID-19. Higher weight individuals um, often identified by the medical term obesity um, by themselves do not have um, a disability unless, again, there are intervening intersectionalities, things like high blood pressure, diabetes that may, that may accompany higher weight. So again, you want to make sure that you're not only identifying CDC or risk factor categories, but you're also analyzing them under disability civil rights laws to determine if that's where the protection might come from. Certainly there's options for protection from other statutes, but um, we're focusing today just on these term of art disabilities under disability rights laws. And so we will move on. And here actually is the most challenging question of all in terms of a legal question, is COVID itself a disability? So in thinking about this, we can certainly identify impairments because it's an impairment of respiratory systems and perhaps many other systems. So it can be a physiological disease or condition. It can certainly affect many bodily systems. Um, and to the extent that in its acute phase, it is limiting or substantially limiting major life activities. Um, it is going to kick you into these entitlements to non-discrimination and accommodation. There's also the potential for the highly contagious nature of COVID-19 to add new analysis about major life activity limits. And this is all the things that we used to take for granted in the before times, like interacting with others, functioning socially, attending schools, traveling, buying groceries, working, all of those things can now be limited in ways that they were not prior to the pandemic. We can also think about the idea that limitations on major bodily functions, which is part of the definition analysis um, under some of the key federal statutes can include things like limit limiting normal cell growth. The challenge in, in some of this analysis is if COVID is a very brief acute illness and then resolves um, what the implications of that are. Certainly that could potentially be a record of a disability, but generally um, if, it, if it's not continuing, it may or may not be an actual disability depending on the impacts. And again, 
case law is likely they're already locked it's going they're going to begin filtering up to the appellate courts on these critical analytical questions so we will move on so this association protection idea is the idea that even if you yourself do not have a disability you might be associated with or interacting with someone who does so this can be members of your household it can be members of the business community or the social community or the faith community in which you function. Um, there are some limits to the federal entitlement because assuming association protection or establishing association protection does not get you the right to reasonable accommodation under federal law. And that's a very challenging for the pandemic because of course, um, for people in multi-generational households, what they really want is an accommodation based on their association at times. Little different relationships under California case law, potentially broader. Um, again, that's going to continue developing. Um, and just to flag, there's no particular type of relationship that's required. The, the issue is, is there an association? It can be familial, it can be collegial, it can be a roommate, um, a relative, it doesn't. Um, affect the protection. And on we go. Now I'm going to turn it over to Sydney to take us into the reasonable accommodation provisions. Thanks, Linda. So jumping into the reasonable accommodations analysis, um, we're going to define reasonable accommodations more generally on the next slide and provide a number of examples. But these are some of the key concepts to keep in mind. So reasonable accommodations can, of course, include physical communication and policy adjustments. We, we want to highlight, of course, that nexus matters. And we'll talk about this on one of the upcoming slides. But this is really about making clear in the request the relationship between the disability and the barrier and how the accommodation helps to alleviate that barrier. And then of course, the, the direct threat defense, we're also gonna be discussing this concept. And for now, we can say that this defense has to do with the risk that a tenancy or an, or an accommodation poses to other tenants or their property. So reasonable accommodation defined. The concept that policies and practices must be modified or changed in some instances to accommodate the needs of people with disabilities is common to the statutory schemes of the Fair Housing Amendments Act, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and of course, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so this slide says that discrimination under California housing law includes the refusal to make reasonable changes to rules, policies, practices, or services when these changes are necessary to allow a person with a disability an equal opportunity to use and enjoy the home. Case law interpretations of necessary. So we're not going to be getting into the logistics of an accommodations request in this presentation but we will definitely include a number of resources in the slide notes on what to include in a request, how much information to include about the disability itself, the timing of the request and the interactive process. But for now, I really wanted to highlight one of the most important components of a request, and that is illustrating how the accommodation is tied to the person's disability. And so, all the concepts on this slide come from case law. And, and just walking through them, the first one, without a causal link between a landlord's policy and a tenant's injury, there can be no obligation on the part of landlords to make a reasonable accommodation. Accommodations must be made for the practical impacts of a disability not just the physical manifestations of the disability itself. And then of course, this can be proven by showing that the desired accommodation will 
affirmatively enhance a disabled tenant's quality of life by ameliorating the effects of the disability. Long story short here, when drafting an accommodation request, you want to be clear about how the disability makes it challenging for the person to meet whatever the requirement is and how the accommodation requested would help eliminate that requirement or barrier. And we'll walk through a couple of examples here shortly. So uh, these are examples of accommodations that were relevant prior to and are of course relevant post pandemic. This is not there, there's really not going to be a fine, a finite list of reasonable accommodations in housing, either before or after COVID-19. Uh, and of course, many accommodations that were needed before are still needed now. And so this slide really lists some of those. And a couple that I wanted to emphasize, which illustrates sort of the broad scope of accommodations that could be requested in the housing context are so something that might be considered a physical adjustment would be maybe adjusting parking spots, requesting an accommodation for a closer parking spot, an accessible parking spot, or potentially a parking spot for a caregiver or a support person, something that might be considered an administrative uh, adjustment or accommodation would be adjusting uh, the rent due date. So this would be requesting an accommodation to uh, pay rent that would coincide with when you receive your um, a benefit payment. And then of course, a communication adjustment. So uh, requesting an accommodation that you, the interactions with the property manager or the landlord be by email or telephone or requesting an accommodation to sign lease documents digitally. And then the next slide, these were really some accommodations that have um, are relevant post post pandemic or now I should say um, these these really are illustrations of um, needs that could that come from the pandemic and also the intersection of of the lives of people with disabilities and so a couple that I wanted to highlight here are uh, number one so safety related adjustments. So requesting an accommodation for flexibility with people who may struggle with complying with safety rules at a complex, such as social distancing um, rules, uh, and also potentially requesting an accommodation, for example, to permit the use of a less trafficked freight elevator um, to ensure that um, social distancing can be followed. Um, another one that I wanted to highlight, oh, of course, which are relevant both pre and post pandemic are modification of, of visitors rules. So if um, an apartment complex has some kind of uh, visitation rules, you could uh, request an accommodation to either permit a caregiver uh, to visit or potentially uh, permit a caregiver or a support person to access, you know, the laundry room, for example, to help you get your laundry or um, the mail room, for example, to help a tenant pick up mail. Um, and then of course, virtual, virtual activities rather than in person. And these would include, for example, video inspections by the landlord or video showings related either to the sale or rental of a property. And so the next couple of slides, we're gonna just walk through a couple uh, reasonable accommodations examples. Um, and so this one is a reasonable accommodation request for, uh, for a video showing. So um, in this context, the standard policy might be that a tenant must uh, allow the landlord to give an in-person showing or tour of an occupied unit for potential buyers or new tenants. And and what we want to do always as advocates is to help is to help figure out for our high-risk 
clients, for example, how to avoid any unnecessary or extended exposure to other people, especially indoors during the pandemic. And so here, the reasonable accommodation analysis to support the policy exception would include, number one, identifying the non-discrimination entitlements. So this would be uh, to equally and safely enjoy the home. Of course, identifying a covered disability, which for our example, we're going to use a person who has asthma, which limits the activity of breathing. We want to establish the nexus, which we talked about on one of the previous slides. And here, because the CDC has identified asthma as a condition that may increase a person's risk for severe illness from COVID-19, and this disability can therefore make it life-threatening to comply with the landlord's policy of allowing people into the unit, um, the accommodation here could be, uh, of course, a request for video or remote viewing instead of in-person viewing. And so this next slide just really writes out, it, it writes out the language of the request. And so the slide says, I have a disability that affects my ability to breathe and puts me at a heightened risk for severe illness from my COVID-19 infection. I am requesting that my landlord utilize video or remote viewing to ensure that I will continue to be able to equally and safely enjoy my home. The final thing that I wanted to say about this accommodation request in particular is that the actual accommodation may ultimately look like the tenant or tenants uh, or the tenant support person, for example, taking a video of the inside of the unit. Um, I, the, the thing about reasonable accommodations is that, you know, ideally both sides will come together and figure out a solution to the actual logistics of how the accommodation will meet everyone's needs. And so the next example of of accommodation request is a situation where a person with disabilities is exhibiting a behavior that violates the lease, but that we want to re request an accommodation for in order to prevent an eviction. So in this context, the standard policy might be that a tenant has 30 days to remove excess belongings that make their unit unsafe or hazardous, and again, as advocates for our high-risk clients, um, we want to help limit any unnecessary exposure to COVID-19. And so here, the reasonable accommodations analysis to support a time extension of an additional 30 days, for example, would include, again, identifying the non-discrimination entitlement, which, uh, of course, is to equally and safely enjoy the home which includes the ability to cure the lease violation, and then identifying a covered disability. Our example, we have a person with multiple disabil disabilities, including type 2 diabetes. We want to establish the nexus. So again, the CDC has identified type 2 diabetes as a condition that increases the risk of severe illness from COVID-19. And because of this, we need extra time to figure out how we're going to safely clean up our apartment and how we're going to come up with a plan, which would also include COVID-19 precautions, to enlist the assistance of family members, potentially social workers and healthcare providers to help us bring the unit into compliance with, with the lease provision. And so the accommodation here, uh, would be extra time to safely clean up the apartment and also to find services to help prevent recurrence. And again, we just wanted to write this um, example out so that folks would have it. So here the language is, I have a mental health disability that causes me to collect belongings and the physical disability that puts me at a heightened risk for severe illness from a COVID-19 infection. I am requesting 60 days to find safe assistance with cleaning out my apartment and to find 
a safe services that will assist me to keep it clean. And this will assure me, this will assure that I will continue to be able to equally and safely enjoy my home. The final point I wanted to make here is that you may be able to receive an accommodation for this type of disability related behavior, even if you do not have another disability that in increases the risk for severe, severe illness from COVID-19, but the request would probably look a little different. So I just wanted to make sure that folks understand that you don't need to have an at-risk disability to request an, an accommodation in these circumstances. And with that, I'm actually going to turn it back to Linda Kill for uh, the next couple of slides. Thank you very much, Sydney. Um, we're actually going to tag team on the reasonable accommodation analysis in the sense that we're now going to start talking about some defenses that landlords or other entities have. Um, and, and one of the ways to think about this, uh, just to set the stage, is that what you're generally starting with is not reasonable accommodation, but any accommodation that you can think of that would potentially assist the tenant in enjoying the home or um, achieving the entitlements that are specified. So after you've identified the accommodation, the, the critical analysis then is, is that accommodation reasonable? Because there are instances where you can identify an accommodation, but it's not necessarily reasonable and therefore it's not gonna be legally required. In the context of the pandemic, it will, I'm sure, surprise no one that one of the defenses that is most prominent is this idea of safety or direct threat. So the issue is, does the tenant per se create a direct threat such that the rental would not be required? That's gonna be very, very rare, but what's more common is, is the tenant's disability or inability to address lease conditions such that there is a direct threat that that person poses to life or property that again is going to mean that there's not a legal requirement to actually pursue um, the accommodation or the entitlement. So the way that we're going to start here is just to step back and flag a constitutional a nuance that I'm actually sort of intrigued how this is going to play out. None of us really knows at this point. But constitutionally, the federated structure of our republic from back in the common law gives the authority for public health primarily to states. Um, this is generally traced to the Tenth Amendment that basically says if you can't find any specification in the federal uh, authority then it devolves to the states. That said, that there, there is in fact some federal implication here. It mostly is going to derive from the Commerce Clause. And the idea is that the federal government is entitled to get involved if something is crossing state lines. Um, so with that constitutional basis, we're going to touch briefly on what the statutory structure is on the federal side. And there's actually a provision that without that constitutional structure doesn't make a lot of sense because it puts two things together that seemingly don't belong together. And this is what I call the smoking double negative in the Americans with Disabilities Act. So there's a provision of the ADA in the miscellaneous title. Um, and again, as Sydney referenced, there's more detail in the slide notes and citations. So um, that will be available to you um, once the presentation is uh, emailed um, for future reference. But what this provision says is it, it has two things of relevance here. It says that the interrelationship between federal and state law is that the federal law has to be met. The states don't have the option to not meet the federal standard, but at the same time, they're entitled to go above and beyond that standard to provide more protection. And then there's this very strange provision, or at least strangely placed provision, which says that nothing in the ADA is intended to preclude 
the prohibition of smoking, which if you pause to unpack that essentially means states can ban smoking if they want to. Now, what's interesting about that in this context is that that double negative is a direct homage to the state authority over public health. So the idea is that the federal government is saying, you recognize the state province on this. We know there are nicotine issues in terms of creating impairments. We know that there are smoking issues in terms of smoking impacting other disabilities, but that's basically the state daily lick. So we're gonna let the state do whatever it chooses to do in that setting. So with that constitutional and statutory background, we get a couple of very interesting questions that honestly, nobody knows the answer to at the moment, such as would a federal mask mandate be constitutional? Possibly that's a commerce clause action. You know, it may be a 10th amendment entitlement for the states. To, to not have federal mandates, that's gonna be an appellate issue that's going up through the courts. Similarly, there is currently the CDC's eviction moratorium. It's not at all clear whether that's constitutionally enforceable. And again, it may be, but what's gonna happen on all of these questions is a burst of litigation that's gonna filter up to the appellate courts. So we, came as far as we could in preparing today's presentation, but it's probably gonna be dated almost as soon as we're done because the developments are moving so quickly and so consequentially. And we will move to the next slide. So the general direct threat analysis, this is the analysis actually that is established in existing statutes, obviously relevant for the pandemic, but not necessarily geared to pandemic considerations. So the analysis includes the following. There's no requirement to accommodate a tenant if the tenancy would constitute a direct threat to the health and safety of other individuals. This is generally understood as a significant risk of bodily harm. There is a nuance um, about whether the threat to yourself is analyzed differently than the threat to others. Um, there's a substantial body of case law on that, and that's something we're more than happy to provide individual analysis as to that issue if it becomes relevant. The direct threat defense has some very strict parameters. It requires an individualized assessment, so you can't just assume that everybody with a respiratory disability or everybody with a mobility disability creates a certain threat. You have to analyze, is that true for this particular person? And the analysis has to be highly objective. So you're not based on stereotypes or guesswork. You're actually looking at objective criteria and making that analysis. Again, you get this idea of the sort of two-step process where if you can identify a threat, much like identifying an accommodation, you're not fully done because the threat may be able to be mitigated through an accommodation. And if that accommodation brings the threat down to the point where it doesn't meet the fair regular, rigorous standard, then you are required to provide the accommodation. Um, so there are certain situations where there's no accommodation that will mitigate the threat, but more often than not, there's things that you can do such as adjusting timing, adjusting path of travel, letting someone move a, use a freight elevator, letting someone do a video showing, et cetera. So on this next slide, we're actually going to go back to the future. Um, it truly is interesting. The pandemic developments really have a lot of parallels in um, early statutory analysis and authority. Um, in terms of just sort of how to start finding medical knowledge, these are the, um, the lists of disabilities that might create risk or threat. Um, you can identify them sort of logically based on the practical impacts that Sydney was identifying. 
but there are also these recognized sources of medical knowledge. So for example, the Federal Public Health Service, the Centers for Disease Control, the National Institutes of Health. So if you're looking in that literature and in those um, resources and you find, for example, something that says there's an assumption that X is um, risky, we actually looked at the data on it, it turns out not to be risky. Or it's risky, but we've discovered, you know, the big example, of course, being a mask, that there are things that can alleviate the risk. So that source of information is going to be available. Of course, that's federal authority, and so it goes back to some degree to our constitutional analysis of how much the feds can tell the states to do things. But in general, um, it's going to be a credible source of a, objective information, and that's sort of the, the vein in which you're looking at it. If there's something not in the federal analysis um, that's relevant, you can certainly make an argument that the state protections are different or more protective. So one of the things that actually made this pandemic really like memory lane to me is the degree to which the pandemic questions are taking us back to the era of the 1980s AIDS epidemic at a time when that was not the chronic medical condition it is now, but truly a lethal um, condition and one that at the beginning was not understood, including not understood as to its transmissibility um, characteristics. So the Americans with Disabilities Act was actually passed in 1990, but like many laws, um, it actually, there was a run at it prior to that, so that Congress had been considering precursor versions of the ADA, and of course there was an even longer threshold for the earliest disability non-discrimination law, Section 504, back in the 70s. So you know, a lot of these statutory issues and analyses are floating around in the 1980s. The AIDS epidemic is raging, and we get a school teacher with ter tuberculosis, and that sounds a little bit like a non sequitur, but what had actually happened is that one of the cutting edge legal cases on whether communicable diseases are statutory disabilities arose in the context of tuberculosis. Um, it was decided by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1987. It's a case called the R-Line case. And what it held was that that disability of tuberculosis um, it is, in fact, the covered disability under federal analysis. And we know that means it's going to also be covered under California analysis. While the decision was related to tuberculosis, it was absolutely anticipated to be the decision that would make or break the coverage of HIV and AIDS in the ADA. Um, there's a lot of interesting legislative history um, in the ADA, and my colleagues know enough not to get me started talking about it because I'll, I'll go on for, for many an hour about it, but I'll just flag two things that are, again, very relevant now. One is that there was a an attempt during the ADA passage process to ban people with HIV and AIDS from working in food handler positions. So this would be things like kitchen work, restaurant work, um, uh, any type of food, food handling scenario. Um, that amendment was actually defeated um, and it was defeated in large part because there was a recognition that it didn't have an appropriate grounding in objective evidence. So this is what I call the nothing to fear but fear itself aspect of communicable disease analysis, where the issue is, yes, there are risks, there can be lethal risks, but rather than speculate about their existence or their implications, we're actually going to go deep into the data and try to understand the risks, not just for purpose of identifying threats, but for purposes of identifying accommodations that can ameliorate those threats. And again, we have very strong analogies to smoking, not just because that was the statutory grounding for um, the miscellaneous provision of the ADA that I discussed, but also because smoking has many of the similarities that we see with the pandemic. 
nicotine addiction potentially is an impairment. So the implication of the thing that's causing the problem is that it may be a covered disability, much like COVID may be a covered disability. And then also that um, that risk threat affects other people. So your nicotine addiction may create secondhand smoke for the neighbor in the next apartment. Um, similarly with the pandemic, we're gonna have scenarios where um, the implications of COVID-19 for one tenant may potentially impact other tenants. And the best example is people unable to wear a mask due to some type of disability. Um, so the good news perhaps as we're in this brand new landscape is that we can mine sources, including the HIV AIDS epidemic and the smoking literature and briefing on all those issues to try to figure out, you know, what the best legal answer is relevant to the pandemic. And I will turn it over to Sydney to uh, take us to the end. Thanks, Linda. This is Sydney. So um, these last couple of slides are about um, California tenant protections. We wanted to briefly cover two important um, California laws, and we will also include some additional information in the notes here from housing organizations that are working on the front lines of eviction defense. And it will, will also provide some additional information on the interplay between these laws and the federal eviction moratorium, which we won't get into here, but it's very important. So we wanted to definitely provide um, some resources on those from organizations that are doing that work. Uh, so the two laws that we wanted to briefly go over are AB 1482, the California Tenant Protection Act of 2019, and AB 3088, which is the COVID-19 Tenant Relief Act of 2020. And so AB, AB 1482, so the, the California Tenant Protection Act of 2019 uh, went into effect prior to the pandemic at the beginning of this year and provides important tenant pr protections that limit how much rents can be increased as well as the allowable reasons for evicting tenants in covered units. And so if you've been renting a covered unit for at least 12 months, your landlord may not evict you without what's called just cause. And just cause means a permitted reason such as you failed to pay the rent, you broke important rules in the lease or the owner the, or the owner's spouse, domestic partner, child, grandchild, parent, or grandparent plans to move in. And so the law also states that the maximum rental increases within a 12 month period is is 5% plus the local cost of living increase or 10% whichever is lower and then if the just cause is not your fault you are entitled to one month's rent as relocation assistance and these protections are in place until at least January 1st 2030 there are a number of exceptions, and the one of the ones that I wanted to highlight is that um, units that or or buildings that were built within the last 15 years are not covered. Um, certain single-family homes are not covered, and then some categories of specialty housing, such as uh, dorms, hotels, and care facilities, may also not be covered. And then moving on to AB 3088. So this bill protects you from eviction for non-payment of rent due to a COVID-19 financial hardship. And um, really quickly, COVID-19 related financial hardship includes things like, um, of course, loss of income caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, increased expenses directly related to health impacts of COVID-19, and then increased costs for childcare or attending to an older adult, a person with a disability or a sick family member, 
related to COVID-19 and there are some others. So basically, if you are behind on rent that was due from March 1st, 2020 to August 31st, 2020, you can't be evicted for this debt, but your landlord may sue you in small claims court if you cannot repay 50% of what you owe by February 28th of next year and 100% of what you owe by August 31st, 2021. And then if you are behind on rent that was due from September 1st, 2020 to January 31st of next year, you can't be evicted if you submit a declaration for hardship for each month and pay a total of 25% of the rent due for the entire five-month five period by January 31st, 2021. So if you make this payment on time, you cannot be evicted by for the remaining rent that you owe for these months. And then the other um, point that I wanted to make was that starting on March 1st, 2021, landlords can take tenants to small claims court for the unpaid COVID-19 rent um, that, that accrued between March 1st, 2020 of this year and January 31st, 2021 of next year. And with that, we have reached the end of the presentation. We really hope that this was informative and that folks feel like they can use reasonable accommodations as a tool to help uh, keep people housed during this crisis. Again, um, we encourage you either to put your questions in the chat now or to email me or call me, whichever works for you. Um, my, my email address is spickern at dreadf.org and my phone number is 510-644-2555. Um, again, please uh, reach out to us. We will follow up with you individually with your questions. And I want to, again, thank you for joining us. And we sincerely hope that everyone has a safe end of the year and that we hope that we will see you next year and that you will join us for more trainings next year and we really look forward to continue to do this.